Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction and all its high octane action to you, the viewer. Today, I am going to ask and answer a simple question. Why do missiles show up so often in science fiction, and why are there so many variations of them when you could choose from any kinds of the fanciful energy and magic weapons and projectiles that exist out there? This is going to be more of a meta dive into what this weapon system offers to writers and science fiction universes as well as how we see them applied in said universe. Before we get into in any of that, however, if you enjoy the video and want to support good ol' Psy, then check out our Patreon linked in the description and pinned comment below. And if space bucks are short, like, sub, comment, and share the video around because every little bit helps, and your AI overlord demands algorithm fodder. And with that, on to the video proper. So before we get into why are missiles, we need to discuss what are missiles. As far as I see it, they can be comfortably broken down into three broad categories. Conventional combat missiles, unguided pain pylons, and utility or electronic warfare torpedoes. And I want to make something clear right at the beginning here. The words rocket, missile, and torpedo are meaningless in science fiction, and I will be using them interchangeably. Over time, words and their meanings drift as the popular conception of them does, and in this case, that's happened for, well, all of science fiction. In real life terms, rocket, missile, and torpedo are very different and distinct things with a lot of overlap, but in science fiction, they're more like a hairband. Sure, they're technically all different, but functionally identical, and no one really cares for the difference. Just pick whichever name you like the most. So, what are missiles? In their most basic form, they're a long, vaguely phallic-shaped tube with high explosive packed on one end, a giant rocket strapped to the other, and guidance equipment in the middle. Or just more explosives. Rocket engines work by carrying some form of solid or liquid reaction mass that's burned off to power the thing. As that reaction mass, well, reacts, it expands and is squeezed out the rocket's drive cone at the back, the resulting force pushing the missile forwards at insane accelerations. In some cases, missiles may also have secondary engines along the sides or the tip to assist in rotation, such as the torpedoes we see in the Expanse having small RCS thrusters along the sides and the front to help them rotate after being fired. And that is the most fundamental and simple explanation of them, and basically all of them work by that principle even when you see vastly different visual forms. And that brings us to the different types, starting with number one on the list, the conventional combat missile. These are essentially the bog standard in every sci-fi universe ever. They make up the bulk of missile depictions because they're simple analogs for what already exists in real life. They're essentially just current day missile tech in space. Classic examples are the prior mentioned torpedoes from the Expanse or the missiles we see in Halo or the Stargate series. These also include more exotic kinds, like the photon torpedoes from Star Trek, which are, for all intents and purposes, just normal missiles, but they glow for some ungodly, unnecessary explanation. As for the payloads, they tend to similarly carry the standard high-explosive adjacent filler, or, in more exotic cases, things like plasma, flèche, or shape charge warheads. But for the most part, they're the standard can opener of militaries everywhere, dealing with any problem they may be put up against by exploding with wondrous performance and force. There's honestly not much to say here about them, or too many examples, because, I mean, there's not much the average person won't know, and if I tell you, hey, this is a standard missile, I'm pretty sure every single person out there, even if they don't know sci-fi, can pretty easily understand what I'm talking about. However, there is a sub-variety that is almost never seen. It's the unloved brother told to stand behind the curtain at sci-fi family get-togethers when they're taking the pictures, and that would be the Interceptor Missile. These are the same structurally to the bog standard we talked about, with the difference being their stat points. You see, while regular missiles distributed their character creation points evenly, the Interceptor went full into speed with no stamina or strength. These type of missiles are often full, far smaller and with a pitifully short flight range, but are the fastest types of missiles out there. They're specifically designed and used in most sci-fi depictions for turning any incoming undesirables into Kessler Syndrome as soon as possible. It's the guided munition version of the Holy Wall of Flak or Point Defense Cannons from the Y Guns video. 
which, by the way, is a similar video to this on kinetic weapons. Go check it out, shameless self-promotion. For the most part, these small and nimble missiles are also common on fighters, where they find most of their use. Imagine the scene from Star Wars Episode 3 where our Jedi friends are being chased by the very slow and obliging droid missiles. Unfortunately, we almost never see them outside of that laser-specific example because they are essentially, um, how do I put this? They invalidate every other type of guided munition and most types of fighters and drones. And that's because there's a basic issue with writing these types of missiles. Now, you know, missiles in general are not accurate in sci-fi because realistically they will always accelerate faster and turn harder than anything else in space. So in harder science fiction universes like The Expanse, this means they would be extremely effective at hitting and destroying incoming capital ship torpedoes, as well as blowing up ships in close quarters battle so effective to the point that they would basically invalidate other types of guided munitions and force the setting to rely mostly on projectiles like railguns. And in softer sci-fi, nobody really cares because lasers and magic techno babble is the meta for space combat there. So interceptor missiles are often intentionally left out or outright ignored because who cares? And that brings us to the next major type of rocket weapons in sci-fi, unguided pain pylons. These are similar to the prior mentioned examples, but instead are dumb fire. You need to predict where the enemy is going to be, fire your torpedo salvo, and hope they sail into it. There's no guidance and no stopping once it's fired, unlike guided and smart missiles from before, which may not detonate if a ship it hits has a friendly IFF. Once Mr. Pain Pylon leaves his launch tube, he is not your, nor anyone else's friend. Please use caution, because this is the weapon responsible for the most team kills in every game it shows up in. An idiot with the spanker from Halo says fuck your killstreak. These types of missiles are often depicted as far more powerful and dangerous as they are both often much larger than regular missiles, but also trade any internal space the guidance systems and, well, complex maneuvering thrusters may take, and they replace all of that with more magic boom juice. The biggest difference is that unguided missile systems are often used to fill a specific role in science fiction. They are a dedicated anti-capital ship, fortification, or static structure weapon that's used mostly for destroying very large and hard-to-miss targets. And the reason for that is you will never hit anything small and fast over the massive distances of space with a dumbfire projectile. They would have to be stupidly close and directly in front of the torpedo launch tube to even have a chance if it can't track them. As such, the dumbfire danger pylon is often the doomsday weapon or giga-powerful bomb used to blow up planets or something, I don't know. 40k says hello. In that setting, a single ship launch torpedo can crack a cruiser in half, but it takes quite some time and a blessing from Big E as they trundle their way across the void. If there's a black hole bomb or antimatter payload or transversal antichroniton quantum warhead, then it's often one of these things that it's mounted to, and you have no idea how many takes it took me to say that in one go with no stuttering or issues. And with the dumb fire lads explained, we can now talk about logistics and support missiles. Similar to the dumb fire section, these ones exchange parts of their internals for something else. In the case of E-War munitions or probes, they sacrifice the warhead and explosive payload to instead mount extra sensors and electronic assistance packages. Essentially, these things are the attention-seeking needy stepchild of the missile family that thinks they're going to be in the will. They will not. And that's because, for the most part, these things are useful based entirely around what techno-nonsense needs to get done. If communications are being interfered with, launch a comms and sensor system on the head of a torpedo past the disruption to carry your communication signal clearly. Need to counter an incoming enemy missile attack and still refuse to let poor little Interceptor out of the basement because you're a terrible person? Fire a missile carrying a signal spoofing array and interference package to disrupt and break the targeting lock of said incoming munitions. Need to see around a small piece of terrain, uh, like a moon? Fire a missile with camera systems and a transmitter around the side to find any ambushes before you fly into them in 10 or 20 hours. Hell, want to board an enemy ship? 40k's got your back again! Fire a boarding torpedo with the payload being 10 foot tall walking tanks screaming something about an emperor. Essentially, 
The utility missile does anything and everything you might need it to, filling the role of anything that can't be done by a regular ship or standard explosive, and often coming dangerously close to what you could consider a drone or probe, but generally they're their own unique thing, and normally the easiest way to distinguish them is that drones or probes can be recovered, while electronic warfare torpedoes and missiles and that kind of stuff, they can't. They're a one-use kind of thing. In fact, a great example of this in real life actually are radar spoofing missiles. A lot of modern militaries have missiles especially designed to make as much quote-unquote noise as possible to attract the attention of radar-guided SAM sites by mimicking the signal returns of a fighter jet. When the radar lights up to track and fire, the launching stealth fighter or farther off heavy planes can launch a radar tracking missile back to destroy the SAM site. And while I would re love to regale you with hours of explanations of how all this stuff works, I... I am a caveman. I don't know. It is beyond my ability to explain any more than the missile knows where it is because it knows where it is not. So without further ado, after learning what missiles are, we shall discuss why missiles are. In the Why Guns video, I explained that guns are used for three reasons. Their limitations inherently forcing creativity, their visual clarity making things easier to understand and show slash write, and their simple flexibility meaning you can scale them up or down easily without needing special justification. For missiles, things are a little different. The first reason they're used is because unlike guns, they have very few limits. Missiles are essentially a blank slate for whatever a writer or creative wants them to be. They could be extremely powerful and a mainstay weapon as we see in The Expanse. They could be light and fast, used as secondary weapons of limited power such as we see in Halo, with their general ineffectiveness against Covenant shields. The inherent ability to scale their firepower and mobility up or down however you want, as well as filling them with pretty much any payload you could imagine, lets missiles fill essentially any role in science fiction weaponry. Missiles are also inherently inconsistent in sci-fi, meaning that people get away with a lot more deus ex machinas than they otherwise would normally. We see time and again a classic hallmark of sci-fi, missiles exploding just off bore or a little too far away, and presenting a moment of terror and spectacle that leaves our hero barely able to escape unharmed. Even in The Expanse, we see very near detonations of torpedoes do almost nothing aside from jam or damage the PDCs. Their guidance is also often up in the air. For side characters and unimportant filler ships, the missiles act as normal and turn them into the front page of an obituary. For main characters, they're clumsy and dumb and often lose track, allowing for daring do and the skill of the pilot to shake them off or get them to hit something else. This flexibility allows someone to curate action scenes as they want far more than other weapons like guns or energy beams and stuff which are at their most basic a hit or miss fight with two ships punching the hell out of each other. And that segues in 2.2, drama. Missiles are a uniquely dramatic weapon system compared to most other things, more so than almost anything else I would argue because they are slow as molasses flowing uphill in winter. Because of how slow missiles are in respect to other munition types and the fact they're guided, they exist in this weird maybe maybe not space in any battle. Because of this delay, tensions keep rising, drama gets more and more frantic, and the final climax doesn't come until it's either intercepted or hits home, and the scenes hold the audience's attention in an ironclad grip right up until that moment. And that's because reasonably, you don't miss or fail to hit with a missile until it's flown past the target or been shot down, meaning it has to get very close to whatever it's targeting, and it tends to put a lot of stress and danger on the make-believe crew in whatever setting it's shown up in. In Battlestar Galactica, there is one scene that I always really enjoyed. There's multiple across the series, but one that really stuck sticks out to me, and that was when the Colonials had to leave behind a number of ships that can't jump to safety. They're stuck at sublight velocities. The Cylons find them, and those jump-capable ships flee. There's a slow, agonizing scene where you watch the Colonials debate and mull over the decision, seeing the hopeless desperation as they make the decision to leave. You see children and people just going about their lives, hear the frantic calm chatter, and things keep dragging on. 
and even when the Cylons finally get there and fire, the tension just gets worse. The missiles track in slowly. You get to see in excruciating slow motion what they are streaking towards. But you hope. You think no. Right up until the moment they hit, there's hope. Something is going to save them, they'll get away, maybe some casualties will be suffered, but the Galactica or some Vipers will show up at the last moment, surely, and the Holy Wall of Flak will save the day. And you sit there watching as they get closer and your hope turns to horror and ice in your veins, and then everything fades to white, then black, and the scene is over. And the drama isn't solely due to the weapons here, we'll acknowledge that, obviously, but they do have a unique feel of delaying the inevitable and giving one last chance. Lasers or gunfire in the same scenario is fast and brutal. It would be a quick release of tension through flare and violence. But missiles are like a slow, silent hunter that forces you to sit there and watch death approaching, unable to do anything or really even enjoy the action scene, other than silently hope that something will save you. All in all, missiles are used due to their flexibility in how they perform and the multitude of ways they can be employed. They provide a huge amount of narrative control over an action scene compared to most other weapon forms, allowing a writer or director to present and preserve tension and drama as and how they want. And as a surprise third reason, they are unbelievably hype. They represent some of the most balls-to-the-walls, dynamic and pulse-pounding insanity possible, to the point where I can't really show you simple visuals for this. Instead, enjoy a brief montage of why missiles Flawless, unbelievable entertainment. It is pure dumb spectacle, and I love it. There's also a term in there called the Otano Circus, which is a Japanese style of missile animation, and it so perfectly portrays what it feels like seeing the absolute panic and terror of this chaotic swarm of death coming after you. Watching them body ships and tanks and people and really anything is just so satisfying. Missiles exist in science fiction because they are the most aggressively dynamic and frantic style of weapon in sci-fi, and because they are hilariously awesome. But that's just my opinion, feel free to discuss or list other examples in the comments below, I'd love to hear what you think, or if I missed anything since I am just a human after all, let me know. And before we go, however, a thank you to all of Sai's patrons, supporting the channel and generally being fantastic. With a special thank you to the food merchants feeding my co-host David G, the original, Augie, Eleven Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, the other one, Silencer, and Vox Apollyon. Thank you all very much for your ongoing support. I appreciate it greatly. And with that, the video is functionally over. A little bit longer than I normally do for these uh, weekend opinion pieces, but it is what it is. And it's going to come out a little bit later than normal because I got very distracted by the absolute chaos going in in Ukraine. It looks like we're cruising for Russian Civil War or Revolution Mark IV. Wonderful. History repeats itself. So, I hope you've had a good day. Outros are hard. Goodbye!